Traveling things in association with rugged wear, real people, real clothing, real solutions presents In Conversation With. And today I'm chatting to Des Lindbergh, who's one of the authors of this particular book, Every Day is an Opening Night. Des, hi, how are you doing? David, I'm well, thank you. Well, I'm relatively well because I've smashed up my left knee in a, in a fall on my driveway. But I'm, I'm had, I had surgery and I'm confined to barracks. The <laughs> barracks are not too bleak. <laughs> Never a dull moment in the Lindbergh household by the sounds of things. Yep. So let's talk about the book. And I suppose let's start off with with the sad part, which is the last chapter of the book. And I know I'm sort of jumping right through it to the end because you lost Dawn just over a year ago. And I think there are still those of us who knew and loved her who are still reeling, reeling from the shock of, of hearing of her passing. Well, you know, include me there because sure. uh, Dawn had, um, if I could start, from the point towards the end of the book where Dawn had already penned a last chapter. Right. And the last chapter was, ref was reflective on what it is to be in showbiz, what it has been to be in showbiz and what it means to enter showbiz. So she talked about auditions and she talked about um, the, uh, the, the passions for the theater and so on. And then at the end, she, she asked herself the question, and where are we going and when? Nowhere at all was her answer, and she raised the glass and said, Lechan. Yeah. Now, she'd written that chapter, and of course, when she passed, um, I was rushed to hospital in Cape Town um, by air ambulance, and uh, Hatsola uh, took me to Cape Town and put me in a hospital for three weeks with COVID. And uh, when I came back, I realized that my biggest task was to finish the book. That didn't mean writing the last bit of the book, but working on the book. And then I realized that the last chapter would have to be an additional chapter, mm. which told the story that I just told. Yeah. So now let's go back to the beginning of the book. And I suppose I should put my cards on the table. I've known you guys since 1973, when you brought still one of my favorite productions, to Port Elizabeth, which was Godspell. And I know over the years, I nagged Dawn incessantly to bring it back uh, because I still thought it was very, very relevant. So let's go back to, to the beginning of the book and, and let's, let's talk through the chapters and let's talk through the rationale behind writing it. Right, well, you know, we realized quite early on that, that the story we, we had in our lives which had never actually been written down except by the odd journalist who wrote an article about this or that production, we, we realized that we had to somehow uh, write it all down. And so Dawn started to write um, a book. Didn't have a title at that point, it was a book. Um, I started to write bits of the book, which, which I felt should be there. And we realized that we were writing different kinds of account yeah. of the same thing. Um, the one might be to do with showbiz, the one might be to do with a love affair, uh, with our love affair yeah. uh, together, because we, we were together for 55 years. And um, uh, we started to, to chronicle things. And then we started, when we got to Plett, I'm, I'm going to jump around a bit too. When we got to Plett to live, when we left Johannesburg, we decided to um, uh, read the book to each other. And we sat at a table in the very room where I am now, and we started reading uh, the script, the manuscript. And I realized that, uh, that it really is not a, a monologue or a biography, it's a, it's, it's a dialogue. It's a dialogue between two people who've been together a long, long time. <laughs> And uh, so that's where it started. Um, that's how it kicked off. And uh, of course, we told different stories about different bits. You mentioned um, Godspell. We've done uh, between us, uh, well, in fact, together, Dawn and I have done six different Godspells all over the place. Right. Um, and uh, the very first one was, was history making. It, it was. Uh, yeah. For me, it was. It was yes. Sorry, I didn't catch that. 
I said it was groundbreaking for many reasons. Yes. Well, the reason why we chose to do Godspell was basically and, and primarily because we needed a, a production, a vehicle, which could be for all races, viewed by all races in South Africa. And we heard about Godspell and we went to look at an amateur production in, um, in uh, Salisbury then, in Rhodesia, what's now Harare. And it was excellent. And we met some people who stayed connected with us on, on Godspell, including Trish McKenna uh, in that production. Right. And we, uh, we decided to apply for the rights. And the reason we were applying for the rights was we realized it was the exact vehicle we needed. It was the exact vehicle we needed to break the log jam of race on South African theater. So um, we, we got the rights and we went to London to see the production there, which was with David Essex and, and uh, uh, Jeremy Irons, who we got to know. And <laughs> what a magnificent production it was. These two actors were superb and they were young and they were our age. Mm -hmm. And it spurred us on to, to continue with um, the project. But why, why I'm mentioning all this is because the main object of doing God's Bill was to unite races in South Africa, right. to let people know that it was okay to be black or white or any other color and be together on the stage or in an audience. So we signed a contract which said we'd guarantee both. And we ran into our first headlong, into our first barrier. And that was that in South Africa, the Group Areas Act which was a very badly drafted and very unnecessary act, uh, forbade us, would not allow us even to rehearse it properly in Johannesburg. Right. We did it. <laughs> the rehearsals were held on our lawn in, in Houghton. Yeah. And, on the wagon. Uh, we, uh, uh, sorry? On the wagon near the swimming pool. Uh, right near the, the wagon on, and, and the swimming pool. Yeah, yeah, there wasn't a swimming pool there at that no. time. And, uh, and so we rehearsed on the lawn and um, uh, we put together a super cast and realized that if we were going to open this production with a lot, big flourish, uh, we would have to do it outside the border. The nearest border was Maseru of mm -hmm. Lesotho. And we decided crossing the Caledon River was like crossing the Rubicon <laughs> in South African uh, showbiz history. So we took it to Maseru to a half completed theater. And we, we helped complete the theater, put lights up. Uh, David Marks came as our sound engineer. His wife was our costume mistress. And we were ready to go in a brand new building. And the people flocked. I couldn't believe, nor could Percy Tucker at the time, that people would drive 350 kilometers to see a production about the crucifixion uh, uh, in, in a foreign country called Lesotho. Right. But we opened there, and there's a wonderful story around that because the, the king of Lesotho and the prime minister, the Abu Jonathan, had not spoken to each other for some years. Uh, there was a lot of political tension, and we invited them both, and uh, Sir Seretsi Kama and Ruth from Botswana right. to come to the opening. And they did come and there they stood together and they chuckled their way through a very funny and super production, if I say so myself. And, and we feel that the log jam had been broken, not only in South Africa, but right there in Lesotho as well. And uh, everybody had a party. <laughs> now, the book is not, is not one of your normal sort of 200 page paperbacks. This is a serious tome, Des that covers, as you say, 55 years of, of you being together, going back to Folk on Trek. And as I'm talking to you about Folk on Trek, I remember as a sub-A student, there are just a few years between you and I, um, I think two decades maybe, but you came to Port Elizabeth, you and Dawn came to PE and played at our school. I remember you doing the Chazumfani Bayer. I must have been six at the time and I was enamored <laughs> with these two folkies who had come all the way from somewhere that I didn't even know. Who, how did I know in Port Elizabeth as a six-year-old where Johannesburg was? I had no point of reference but you came and you stood on our little make uh, made up stage in the school hall and you sang amongst others so you know 
you, you, I think you've made an impression on several generations and that Des and Dawn as Des and Dawn are, you can't say one without the other, it just doesn't work. But you have, you have stamped your mark on, on the foot, or you made your footprint on the musical side of, of South Africa for, for certain. Well, Dave, it's lovely that you remember that so far back because you must have been quite small at the time when we came to your school. And we played many, many times in Port Elizabeth. There's some wonderful Port Elizabeth stories, including a war with the government over, over uh, Tully Peterson in the book um, later on in, in, in our career. But we were touring. We were touring everywhere, all the way from the Cape to Kariba, mm. all the way across from from um, KwaZulu Natal, which was then Natal, all the way through, of course, to the other side of the country and playing in the Northern Cape and places like that. And, and we became very, very well known. Remember, this was uh, at, the, at the beginning of our folk singing career was before the advent of te advent of television in South sure. Africa. Yeah. And, and we had to go to those towns for people to know us. Radio was incredibly powerful, and we realized this at an early stage, and our recordings were, were used on radio a lot, yeah. which helped us to, to, it helped us build an audience who wanted to come and, and see us and meet us, and they did. They came in their thousands, and, and we did it with Round Table in South Africa and with, with Lions Clubs in Rhodesia, right. and we, we gave a, a large proportion portion of the door uh, to the charities that those those organizations were, were behind and and it worked like a bomb it really was fantastic it was one of the first uh, touring shows which could go everywhere mm. and uh, in each town there were the challenges but we carried our own equipment a little bit of lighting um, a dimmer board which a guy from the troubadour actually uh, who worked for the post office had built me out of uh, domestic dimmers and and things and and and, and, and bits and pieces um, and and of course a, a very nice little sound system from Italy called a Miazzi. Hmm. The Miazzi sound system was uh, small to carry but pretty loud even in the open air <laughs> and uh, so yeah we started to tour together the, the and and we, used we did go. Days. Sorry, I spoke over you. We did. went everywhere. The van that you used in those days. Do you know what happened to it? Uh, we we've originally really bought a, a, a three a three a three quarter ton truck mm. by GMC, and we we towed a caravan behind it. Right. Um, the eighteen foot Jurgens caravan, and uh, which was. Absolutely amazing for touring. It was wonderful. I built on the back of the, the van, I built um, uh, somewhere for the stage manager to sleep and for the guitars to sleep and for the cats. We took two cats with us. They slept there too. And we parked in people's driveways. We parked in caravan parks. We were not trailer park trash, but we were trailer park folk singers. <laughs> it was a different time though. I wonder if you could do something like that today, though. I think television would probably help that to happen mm -hmm. because pe people are still very um, open to the idea of meeting the artists that they've seen on, on the box. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we hadn't been seen on the box, so we were very fresh um, and young and recently married. Um, <laughs> You know, we had no children at that stage and right. uh, we had decided, uh, Dawn, Dawn in fact wasn't a singer when we teamed up um, and she wasn't a guitarist. And I gave her a guitar and she said, but I can't play the guitar. I said, okay, well, I'll teach you. Well, that was a very stupid thing to say to Dawn because Dawn wanted, she wanted to learn proper guitar. So I taught her everything I knew in 20 minutes and she went off to Dietrich Wagner, who was a, a great teacher of classical guitar. Right. And if you look at any of the pictures, my hands are in the wrong position, but Dawn's are in the classical guitar position. <laughs> she played properly. She there's, played there's, properly. There's a lovely country song called Three Chords in the Truth. And I think that's all you need to get by. Dawn obviously wanted more than just uh, CFG or DAG to get by on a song. 
Yeah, and and also she wanted to to be able to play um, in a style which uh, would complement uh, my folky style, right. which was very improvised, and hers was was disciplined. Um, and I was never on a stage with Dawn when I, when I was in doubt about her ability mm. to add a, a color to the the whole. Now remember <clears> that we were playing in an era where um, not only were the sound system very rudimentary, but there was, we took no band with us. We took yeah. no, uh, no bass player, no drums, and certainly no backtracks. It was a live show. Yeah. You, what, what you heard was what you got, and that was it. The string broke, you played with five. That's right. That's right. And and David Marks, um, who I enjoyed your interview with very much on this blog, um, Dave uh, was our stage manager for quite a while on, on some of the tours. And he came with us and he, he really was an, an excellent sound person. Not only did Dave make the sound come out of the speakers, but he recorded every bloody thing. <laughs> Everything he he put through the desk, he recorded, and he, and that is now called the hidden hidden oh, years hidden project. Years. Yeah, um, and and as a result of that, I've given my entire archive mm -hmm. from my studio in Johannesburg uh, to Stellenbosch University, and they've got some of the machines, yeah, which I gave them as well, and they've got all of those tapes, and they're digitizing them. So oh, there is an there's an incredible. Um, uh, there's an incredible library building up in Stellenbosch about what happened in those years. And of course, mm. they, were, they were riddled with politics, riddled with politics. Yeah. There's, the book is such, and I mean, there's, you, as big as the book is, we could talk for hours about it. Were there parts that you decided, look, if we go off in that particular direction, there's going to be another 300 pages, or there's going to be book two, three, and four and you just decided not to, or have you sort of bounced in and out of everything in the 55 years that you and Dawn were, were together? Dave, I think what we did was we relied very heavily on our real recollection of those times, right. of the recollection of the times when we knew things were tough in some ways, um, certainly financially, and we knew we had to tour to make uh, any money at all mm -hmm. uh, which we succeeded in doing but um we didn't there was no part of our of our singing career or our production career or our social activism uh, which was uh buried mm -hmm. um we we that's why the book has 541 pages <laughs> it's it's a mini history of south africa during a very very difficult time for showbiz in south africa have people who have known you over the years and who've read the book come to you afterwards and said, loved your book or hated it, whatever the case might be, but going, don't you remember when you did or we did? And there were stories that maybe you hadn't remembered, but had with a bit of prompting. It, it hasn't happened, but I think, I think that we've been fairly comprehensive because the book has an index. And in the index, the names of people mentioned in the book are, are in the index. So you can see if you're on page 340 something and, and you can uh, decide whether to buy the book or not in the bookstore. Um, but no, we, we didn't leave stuff out and, uh, and not intentionally. And there were a few people who said, do you remember, do you remember? But that's inevitable. Yeah. It's an inevitable thing that happens when you tell your own story. Um, I'm very, um, very proud of the fact that we, Dawn and I discussed together every single piece of content of the book, right. except, of course, the coda, the last, uh, the obviously, last chapter. Obviously. Um, two incidents that I remember when you did the soirees at your old house on the top of the ridge. Um, one was I opened for somewhere, I can't remember who the comedian was, it might well have been Mel Miller. But you very kindly allowed me, or Dawn allowed me to open um, the evening yeah. and do some stand-up. And the other one that uh, my daughter and I still laugh about is when you guys did a version of the Vagina Monologues. And yeah. Jane and I were sitting up at the back with you because uh, you did lighting and sound. And at the end of it, you looked at me and then you turned to Jane and you said, 
your dad can't say a word, can he? And I was, <laughs> once, I was absolutely speechless. And you and my child laughed at me, which was, it's a memory for me, but it wasn't fun at the time. <laughs> well, you know, the Vagina Monologues was a very important piece of, of theatrical work because it was, it was a lens on what it is to be a woman in the world of today. Right. It was written, of course, by Eve Ensler, who took an enormous liking to Dawn when we when we first came uh, to uh, to do it. Um, Dawn Dawn was in part of a what would you call it a celebrity production of it, mm -hmm. and uh, Eve came up to her and said to her afterwards, I love the way you do that sketch, the most controversial sketch, which I can't mention um, even on a blog, <laughs> was she was she was dressed in, in chains and leather and studs with a whip. And, <laughs> and Dawn did this like, like that. And yeah. Eve Ensler just loved it and said, you people could do this production in South Africa. And we took her up on it, we got the rights and we cast it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had various casts, we toured the whole country with it. Uh, there were many people in it who, who um, uh, sort of were in it for one town, one, one city, yeah. and then we replaced them. Like in Durban, we had a different, different uh, cast than from in Johannesburg. But it was very, very well received everywhere. And uh, what it did, Dave, was it, it was almost, um, we, we, we chose songs, we deliberately chose songs which the, the, the actors could sing, mm -hmm. um, which were about women and woman's lot in South Africa, which is, uh, yeah, it's a yeah. subject to this day. Yeah. Um, I forgot to mention, you self-published this book, did you not? Sorry, I didn't catch that, Dave. Sorry, I said, did you self-publish the book? Because writing a book um, is the easy I, part. It, trying to get it published no, is difficult. No, I co-published co the book with uh, um, a publisher called um, uh, Burnett Media. Uh, Burnett Media is a specialized publisher. It's, it's a lot of it is autobiography or motivational uh, books. Mm -hmm. And Justin Cohen, uh, a really well-known uh, speaker on motivation in South Africa, uh, actually put me in touch with his publisher. His right. publisher liked the idea and put me in touch with his editor, the editor who ended up as my editor. Right. And uh, Deborah Rudman was the editor and she was immaculate. She was just wonderful. She even came to Plet twice mm -hmm. during the process of putting the last um, the last touches to the book and she came to visit me here and we, we, we actually went through the night twice reading the book mm -hmm. and, and looking for things that might be difficult or, or not correct mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm deeply grateful to her uh, she wasn't the sort of publisher that uh, that that corrected one's grammar. She was the sort of publisher who, who knew that when you, when you had a title of a show, for instance, The Black Mikado or The Best yeah. Little Whorehouse in Texas, right. um, that, that would be in a certain typeface. Um, and then I had a designer, a very good designer for the book. And when I put the photographs into the book, uh, that designer got it very right. And I chose paper for the book so that the photographs are not far from in fact, they're right adjacent to the text. Yeah. So when you read the book, um, if you're reading about, uh, let's say, uh, the best little whorehouse in Texas, uh, there's pictures of Judy Page uh, and, and the, the leading actors in that. Um, it was the last time, by the way, I played in a band. I, I was the lead. I was the rhythm guitarist in the band and the narrator <laughs> for the best little whorehouse in Texas. Dawn said it was typecasting. <laughs> Which I should imagine also ruffled some feathers. Just the title alone must have put the backs up on some of those blue dress wearing tunnies um, that were so conservative back in the day. Well, we had to go to court, you know, about it. Um, uh, in those days, they'd removed the, the court. Uh, because we won the Godspell case in court, they decided they had to have a special uh, board called the Publications Control Board. Yeah. And, and, and ironically, the judge who presided over the Godspell judgment and allowed us to do it became the chairman of the, of the control board. Mm -hmm. 
And he, he told us there were certain words we could not use. But my advocate, Jules Brody, brilliantly yeah. said, if you take the word whore out of the title, everybody who goes to it will take their kids along thinking it's the little house on the prairie. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so uh, we won the case. Oh. And we had to change a few words, which was not hard. You know, if you were to do that today, it would be a whole different kettle of fish because you can basically say anything you like, both on stage and on television. A whole different um, time nowadays. Um, the book is available in stores. Um, yeah, it's available in all, in all the good bookstores. Right. And it's available direct from me at my email address, which is des at desdawn.co.za. You can't um, be more I, I, either, I, I either consign it, you know, by courier to yeah. the person buying or um, I arrange for it to be collected in Joburg or Cape Town. Josh, my son, has stock in, in Joburg and Adam right. uh, in Cape Town. Okay, so it's, it's all over. You go, there's no excuse for not having a copy on your shelf. If you were at all in No your... excuse... No yeah. excuse at all if you're a South African and you're involved in music, musicals, or, or, or the theatre. The one thing I want to ask you about before we wrap up, and, and I know that we're sort of bouncing around the book and your careers, um, but that's just the way life happens. And specifically on In Conversation With, because I tend to wander off, but I eventually come back to, to where I want to be. The Troubadour was groundbreaking in so many ways. And there were people who came out of that genre of music and then and then vanished unfortunately and elsewhere they would have made become huge stars and I think of pe people like um, Ian Lawrence and Hal Landini and um, Colin Shamley um, yourselves that yeah played there. I mean that that was a, a hodgepodge of folk musicians of note it certainly was. Um, it used to be a gay bar, which was bought by a mining engineer who didn't know what to do with a gay bar because he didn't know it was a gay bar. And so he said to me, can you run a restaurant? <laughs> and I said, yes, of course. And, and I um, immediately renamed it The Troubadour. Right. And, um, and all of the singers you've mentioned and a whole lot of others, entertainers, came to me to ask whether they could play there. Right. Mel Mel who became Mel Mel and Julian, yeah. um, came there with four songs and said they want to come and play. And I said, you can come and play this Thursday night, but if you're not back by next Thursday night with 18 songs, then you can't. Wow. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. They came back with a whole repertoire. And that was the beginning of Mel Mel and Julian. Right. Um, of course, Keith Blundell and the family were involved uh, a lot at the Troubadour. Keith and I were, were partners while Dawn was away in America uh, on a scholarship. Uh, Keith and I had a, a group called the Wattle Tops, mm -hmm. and we used to do um, all kinds of little shows around schools and so on. And I learned so much from, from Keith because he was, a, he was a guy who could do harmony uh, without even thinking about it. He'd, he'd hear a melody line and he'd know exactly what harmony to sing, right. which is a remarkable talent. And I suppose people like Jill Kirkland, um, ah, yes, Jill Kirkland lives here in Plettenberg Bay, where I am now, and she's okay. a terribly, terribly fit and wonderful person who is uh, uh, living on a, a little, a small holding farm just outside Plett, and, and I see her a lot. We, we often go to lunch and so on, and um, she's in good nick. She really is. Oh, that's wonderful. It's always nice to know that sort of, old, you know, um, old folkies never die, they just get too old to tune their guitars or something like that at the end of the day. Yeah, you know, talking of which, I'm, I'm at this stage of, of my loss of dawn, finding it very difficult to contemplate doing solo shows. I know I'm going to have to do some. Mm. I still love to sing. I can play, not as dexterously as I used to. COVID robbed me a little bit of my right-hand dexterity um, of the fingers, mm. but but I, I, I am going to do some performances and I am giving talks. I'm giving okay. talks about the book, what's in the book, our story, and I'm going to festivals. I've already done a couple of those online and I'm, I'm doing one in Craddock and I'm doing one in, in, uh, in um, uh, what's it called, down the Cape. <laughs> um, 
and I'm I'd be invited to do the towns. <laughs> Well, I, I think I think probably I will find a venue in a lot of the towns, like right. George, Nisner, yeah. um, Port Elizabeth, certainly. I mean, absolutely. Uh, I, Dawn and I go back a long way there. It's interesting that you should mention Port Elizabeth because a lot of theatricals, and we always joke about it, uh, a lot of theatricals came out of Port Elizabeth, and you sort of wonder if there was something in the waters, and you go all the way back to John Carney and Ethel Fugark, and um, Alice Kricher, uh, my sister and myself, and a variety of others that, that came out of Port Elizabeth and went straight into show business in one way or another. Well, I can account for that. I, I, I know why that happened. It was okay. because Port Elizabeth, Port Elizabeth not having a civic theater or anything like that, um, didn't have, it didn't have more than, uh, an, uh, shall we call it an amateur, but I don't say that in a derogatory sense at all, yeah. an amateur theater. It had, it had, it used to bring Judy Page to play the lead yeah. in a musical. And, and, and it was extraordinary that, that a town, um, which is an industrial town, rather like Detroit, where Dawn was in, in, in um, America uh, on a scholarship, yeah. uh, it, it, it somehow or other, Port Elizabeth, oh, and there's another thing to account for there. The, uh, the fact that there was a, a very good artistic community, black and white, mm. Jewish and, and, and non-Jewish in Port Elizabeth at the time. And that, that really gave us some, some people who made their mark, uh, including your sister, who, of course, was with Richard Loring for Yonks. For, for, for many um, years. We both got yeah. our start with that Scottish play. But we can say it because we're not in the theatre. We, we played the children of Banquo, the ghost of Banquo's children in Macbeth in 1967, yeah. two of us. And we yeah. walked from yeah. one yeah. side to OP side, got into my dad's car and went home. And that was the beginning of a love affair for both of us. Yeah. Uh, with, with well, let me tell you how I remember you first. Yeah. Was I really became aware of you when you came, uh, when we did Godspell. In, in, I think we did it at the Savoy. Yeah, we did. The first production of Godspell yeah. was at the Savoy Theatre. And you arrived and you said, I want to help. I want to be on the crew. <laughs> and you did. And yeah. you worked on the show. Absolutely. And it was... It was a very nice way to get to know you because obviously I had no idea who you were, what your passions were. Now I do. No. Oh, Des, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, I'm sad that Dawny's not with us. I really and truly am. But that's just the way things go. The book is called Des and Dawn. Every day is an opening night. It's available, as Des said, online. Um, you can contact Des directly. Des at you said uh, Des and Dawn. Um, dot co dot no, just Des at Des Dawn. Des at Des, Des Dawn. Dawn dot co dot za. Co dot za. Or look out for it when next year in a bookstore. Um, Des, once again, thank you so very much for chatting to me. Before we go, I have to go back. Don't go away. I have to go back to um, to the to the marketplace because that's how things work. And I have to thank. Rugged wear, real people, real clothing, real solutions. If you're out and about in the bush, then rugged wear is what you should be wearing. And even if you're in the urban uh, environment, rugged wear is what you should be wearing. Des, once again, thank you so much for being a guest on In Conversation With. I wish you all the very best and I look forward to seeing you once when you're next up in Jahan. Thank you very much. And I certainly will contact you if I'm coming there. I also love to see your father-in-law, Dov, who's a very old friend of ours and has a lot of his cartoons in the book. He's got four pages, I know, because I looked them up in the index. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great stuff. There's, yeah. Once again, thanks so much for being a guest on In Conversation with.